The Beast of Buckingham Palace by David Williams. Part one, The Coming of the Beast. Chapter one, Dark. It was noon and the sky was black. There had been darkness over the kingdom for half a century. For many years before, the people of the earth had not taken care of their home. They had burned down all the forests, reducing every last tree to ash. They had pumped the rivers, lakes and seas full of waste, killing all the fish. They had dug deeper and deeper under the ground for oil until the planet was hollow to its core. Eventually, the earth took its revenge. The ice caps of the Arctic and Antarctic melted. The floods were so mighty that whole countries became submerged underwater. Violent earthquakes shook entire cities to the ground. All that was left behind were piles and piles of rubbish. Volcanoes erupted, pumping billions of tonnes of ash into the air. Without the sunlight, the crops withered and died. Nothing could grow. The kingdom was plunged into an eternal winter. It was the only world Alfred knew. He was already 12 years old, but had never, ever seen sunlight. Often he dreamed how it must have been to feel the sun on your face, or run through a field of tall grass, or swim in a sunlit sea. But it was just that, a dream. The boy had seen pictures of the sun in books and marvelled at it, a perfect circle of gold. Now the moon and stars had become invisible too. Alfred would spend hours and hours imagining how the night sky must have looked with a thousand little lights twinkling through the blackness. He was one of those children who liked nothing more than being alone with his imagination. In truth, he had very little choice, having been sickly his whole life. Soon after he was born, he became ill. As a baby, Alfred had not been expected to survive, but survive he did, just. The child was as pale as snow and as thin as dust. He wore thick glasses to aid his poor eyesight. Often, Alfred was too so weak, he had to stay in bed all day. Thank goodness all around his bed were piles and piles of books. Books, books and more books. Books about animals, books about space. Books about trees, books about dinosaurs, books about books. Books about history were his absolute favourite. The trouble was that there was a strict curfew in this in the building where Alfred lived. Night was the most dangerous time. That was when there was the most chance of an attack from the outside. Lights had to be out at eight o'clock sharp. By the order of the king, anyone caught with lights on would be severely punished. Punishments were brutal in the kingdom. Those in power had returned to medieval forms of torture. The thumbscrew, the iron maiden, the breaking wheel, the pillory, the rack, the scold's bridle, the rat's dungeon, the head crusher, the iron chair. Despite the strict rules, the boy loved his books so much that he would carry on reading by candlelight under his bed covers. The night our story begins, Alfred was doing just that. He was reading a weighty leather-bound book about the kings and queens of Brighton, Britain, <laughs> through the ages. The first known one was Alfred the Great. He'd become ruler. He had become ruler an impossibly long time ago, in 871. The boy was named after that first king, but it was hard to believe anybody would ever describe this Alfred as great. He felt anything but... As the boy was devouring the story of the beheading of the King Charles I in 1649, a deafening sound rocked the room. Kaboom! Alfred dropped his book, thud, and his candle. He nearly set a light to the covers. Whoosh! Smothering the flames and blowing the candle out. Whoosh! He pulled off his bed covers. Whip! A huge explosion outside had illuminated the boy's bedroom with a glowing red, orange and yellow light. Alfred slid out of bed and, using all his strength, limped over to this huge bay window. Just those few steps left him painfully out of breath. <sighs> he leaned out of the window, framed to steady himself. Alfred's bedroom was high up on the top floor. 
From here he could see far across London. A building was ablaze, but not just any building. St Paul's Cathedral. This historic structure, perhaps one of the most famous in the world, had been destroyed. Its huge white dome cracked as if it were nothing more than an egg. Huge plumes of black smoke billowed high into the air. Oh no, thought Alfred, no, not St Paul's. He had seen many London landmarks destroyed over the years. Nelson's column had been toppled to the ground. Crunch. The London eye had plunged into the River Thames. Splash. The Royal Albert Hall's the Royal Albert Hall roof caved in after a bomb had blasted it to pieces. Boom. However, none of these was as sacred as St Paul's. This was a new low. The cathedral had been built after the Great Fire of London in 1666. The glorious structure had miraculously survived the Blitz, when Nazi bombs rained down on London during World War II. But now it was burning to the ground. Alfred's next thought was revolutionaries. This had all the hallmarks of one of their attacks. The boy had never met anyone from this top secret organisation, but the Lord Protector had taught him much about them. From what Alfred had been told, the revolutionaries hated the fact that power had returned to the king. They wanted to overthrow him and behead him, just like the, Reb the Roundheads had done to Charles I during the English Civil War. These revolutionaries stood only for death and destruction. That is why the Lord Protector said they needed to be crushed at all costs. Rat tat tat! That was the burst of machine gun fire. No! The distant sounds of shouts. Ah! Was that a scream? Alfred shivered. As much as he wanted to look away, he couldn't. Every day there were attacks all over London, but explosions on this scale were rare. The boy pressed his hand up against the cold, thick glass and looked out at the devastation. This was the kingdom that Alfred would one day inherit. Chapter 2. Lionheart Alfred was as far away, was as far from an ordinary 12-year-old boy as you could imagine. Inside he felt ordinary, but he'd been told time and time again by grown-ups that he was anything but. Alfred was not just plain old Alfred, he was Prince Alfred. His father was the king. One day himself would be crowned king. Alfred II, ruler of Britain and all its people. The strange thing was that he would become king of a kingdom he had never set foot in. Not once had he been outside Buckingham Palace. The boy's sad face could often be glimpsed at his bedroom, bedroom window at the very top of the building. Just above his window, a flag flew over the roof of the palace. For hundreds of years, it had been the Union Jack, the red, white and blue flag of the United Kingdom. Now, a very different flag flew, one of one that of the Lord Protector himself had instigated. It was a black flag with a golden griffin at its centre. This was a symbol of the new order of things. Britain now had no government, so no prime minister or politicians representing the people. It always had no police force. Instead, the king's personal army, the royal guards, enforced the rule of law. Buckingham Palace had been home to the British family for centuries, since the time of George III. From his history books, Alfred had learned that he had become a royal residence way back in 1761. The palace used to be a sanctuary. Now it was a fortress. Members of the Royal Guard were stationed all along the perimeter wall. The soldiers were instantly recognisable by their long flowing red robes, hoods and horrifying gold skull masks. On their arms they wore black bands with the golden griffin at the centre just like on the flag. Despite looking almost medieval, the Royal Guards were armed with laser guns. Just one zap was enough to blast someone into oblivion. These soldiers guarded those who lived inside Buckingham Palace. The palace had seen better days. The carpets were worn and the wallpaper was peeling off the walls, but it was still a special place. The prince's bedroom was furnished only with antiques. He slept on a four-poster bed in silk pyjamas, though the bed creaked and the pyjamas had holes in them. 
The palace kitchen was stocked with every dish imaginable, as long as it came out of a tin. There were food stocks to last a hundred years or more. Alfred was safe inside the palace, or so he thought. The boy pressed his face closer to the window as the domed roof of St Paul's Cathedral caved in. Despite the horror, Alfred couldn't look away. Then, in an instant, he became distracted. There was a commotion in the corridor. He could hear a struggle and shouts just beyond his bedroom door. Take your filthy hands off me! How dare you! I'm your queen! It was his mother's voice. As fast as he could, which wasn't very fast, Alfred limped across his bedroom and opened the door. The queen was being held roughly by two members of the royal guard. They were meant to protect the royal family, so why are they dragging her along as if she were a criminal? These were strange times, but this was the strangest of them all. Mama! cried Alfred after her. The queen was wearing her long lace nightdress and one slipper. Even though she had been, even though she was being manhandled, she was trying to main, maintain some sense of dignity. This was a lady who prided herself on never having a hair out of place. Alfred had not seen his mother without her hair perfectly lacquered in a do and her face painted with makeup. Right now, her do was unravelling rather fast. Instead of makeup, her face was covered with thick night cream. She looked a sight. Alfred idolised his mother, and it was weird seeing her like this. Alfred, she shouted over her shoulder, struggling with the soldiers to make them stop, because their faces were hidden behind gold skull masks. It was impossible to guess what they were thinking. The royal guards remained silent throughout, which only added to the sense that this was a nightmare. Mama, where are they taking you? demanded Alfred. Get back inside your room, Alfred, and lock the door, she shouted back. But now, and promise me you'll stay there. The boy did not reply. Promise, she pleaded. I, I, I promise, he mumbled. Shocked at what he just witnessed, Alfred retreated and slammed his bedroom door shut. Shtum. He stood still, unable to move. It was as if he were underwater. That too made it feel like being in a nightmare. But this was no nightmare. This was really happening, as if to prove that tears welled up in the boy's eyes, then streamed down his face. His mother, who he loved more than anyone, was being dragged away in the night. And he was helpless to stop it. Alfred looked around his bedroom. There were silver framed photographs of her everywhere. Here she was reading a bedtime story. There she was pushing him on a rocking horse. Here she was helping him draw a picture. There she was playing with his train set. Here she was painting his face like a lion. There she was helping him blow out the candles on a birthday cake. And here she was giving him a teddy bear. In each picture, the young boy was basking in the glow of her love. In one of the photographs, Alfred was dressed up in a suit of armour. as Richard the Lionheart. Richard I was the heroic king of the 12th century, who led crusades in far-off lands. Alfred picked up the picture and studied it. Lionheart. That was his mother's pet name for him. Tears welled in the boy's eyes. He always felt unworthy of that name. He felt nothing like a hero. He'd been ill all his life. Alfred was used to being an object of pity. Sometimes he even pitied himself. Tears ran down his cheeks. He felt helpless to stop his mother being dragged away by the royal guards. Other important people had mysteriously disappeared in the night over the years. The Prime Minister, the Chief of Police, the Head of the Army. Even Alfred's grandmother had suffered the same fate. Lionheart, his mother's voice calling him that name, circled round and round in his mind. Lionheart. Lionheart had been a great, had been a mighty warrior. Alfred needed to summon some of his great 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 ancestor spirit can do something anything Lionheart he said out loud and despite what he had promised his mother he opened his bedroom door creak chapter 3 faceless finds Alfred limped down the corridor steadying himself on the sideboard to catch his breath. 
Quite a few paces ahead, the royal guard's cloaks fluttered as they bustled the boy's mother along. Alfred tried to speed up, but in doing so, he stumbled over a rug. Thud. Twisting his ankle. Ouch! With no chance of catching up with them, he thought of Richard the Lionheart as and called out, I, I, I command you to, to stop! Not only was Alfred out of breath, but he was not used, used to giving orders. As a result, the words came out wonky. Despite Alfred being royal and these being royal guards, the pair of faceless finds ignored him. The Queen turned her head and shouted back to her son, Please, Alfred, I don't want you to see this! There was a look of terror in her eyes, a look the boy had never seen before. His mother had always been a wonder at pretending everything was tickety-boo when it clearly wasn't. She would always make up stories to cover what was really going on. The sound of an explosion in the middle of the night was nothing more than a thunderstorm. She would then stroke Alfred's head until he drifted off back to sleep. After his grandmother had mysteriously gone missing one night from the palace, Mother would make believe that Gran Grammy had written postcards to him. She was the old queen, his father's widowed mother, and much loved by the boy. Alfred always called Grammy, because when he was little, he couldn't say Granny. His mother would read these postcards aloud to him as she put him to bed at night. Dearest, darling grandson, I'm writing to you from the deck of a splendid old cruise ship. I was sailing round and round the world. Please don't worry about me. I'll see you again one day. I promise. I miss you and I love you. Slobbery kisses, Grammy. My darling grandson, Alfred, just little postcards tell you that all is well. Would you believe I'm all the way up Mount Everest? It was quite a hike, but I can see for miles and miles and miles. It is wondrous. I want you to know that even though I am far away from you, you are always in my heart. I miss you more than ever. Kisses and cuddles, Grammy. It was only when Alfred grew up, grew older, that he suspected his mother had written all the postcards herself. When he asked whether they would ever set foot outside Buckingham Palace, the Queen would take her son out, would take her son on an imaginary flight around the world. Hold my hand together, let's fly up, 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 into the air, across London, over the sea, over the pyramids of Egypt, down the Grand Canyon of America, along the Great Wall of China, and back to dear old Blighty in time for tea. In his mind's eye, the boy would see everything his mother described. The adventures gave him hope that one day he would be able to leave the palace. Just then, Alfred felt something, or someone, slam down his shoulders. Duff! He took a sharp intake of breath, that he was so shocked that no sound came out of his mouth. Two large gloved hands were holding on to him. Alfred turned around. It was another royal guard who had somehow crept up on the boy after he'd stumbled on the rug. Silent like the others, he picked the prince up with ease and dragged him back to his room. L let me go, I said. Let me go. Alfred was powerless to resist. In moments, he was deposited back in his bedroom and the door shut behind him. Shtum. He lingered behind the door and listened. Outside, the guard waited for a while before the sound of footsteps betrayed his movements. In his head, Alfred counted to a hundred. As much as he wanted to race through the numbers, he knew that that was a foolish idea. He needed to count until, until he thought the coast was clear. Ninety-seven, ninety-eight, ninety-nine, one hundred. On one hundred, he opened his bedroom door slowly and silently. Then he peeked out and checked that no one was around. The corridor was so clear. So, he tiptoed down it, before hurrying down the long, sweeping staircase and across the grand ballroom. This room once played host to the world's most extravagant parties. Now, it was a ghost of a room. The chandelier was hanging by a thread. The silk curtains drooped on the floor and damp had bl and damp had blotted the walls with dark, ugly patches. Desperately out of breath, the sickly boy stumbled again. This time, he fell flat on his face. Bang! Oof! Alfred noticed there was some kind of powder on his hands and face. At first, he thought it was dust. The palace was encrusted with the stuff. 
But it wasn't dust. This had a smell to it that was different. Chalk! Scrambling to his feet, he noticed that there were faint chalk markings all across the vast floor. It was as if the boy was standing at the centre of a life-sized chessboard. Someone had tried to rub the lines and markings off, but traces were left behind. Alfred bent over. There were words and symbols, but despite his love of books, he couldn't recognise any of them. What's more, there were burn marks on the wood and a large discoloured area where something heavy had been moved. Alfred shivered as he realised something. There were strange going on, goings on in this place. Palace. The boy stood up and walked slap bang into someone. Doof! Or rather not someone, but something. The Octobat. A robot programmed to do all the butler's duties. It was meant to make life easier, but it actually made it harder. Much harder. It looked not unlike an octopus, if an octopus were made of metal and trundled across the ground. Crucially, though, it did have eight arms, each one with a special attachment for performing different tasks. Hence the name Octo for octopus and Butt for butler. Although its name made it sound more like it was an octopus's bottom. The Octobot had the following arm attachments. A spray for spraying nice smells where nasty smells are. A fly swatter for swatting flies. A spoon for stirring a cup of tea. A hand for stroking a corgi. A hoover for hoovering up crumbs. A croquet mallet for playing croquet. A duster for dusting a shelf. An iron for pressing a shirt. Good morning, Mr President, jabbered the Octobot. It was always getting things wrong. Oh, hello, Octobot, whispered Alfred. I wasn't expecting to bump into you. Please, can you keep your voice down? Roast chicken, replied the Octob replied the robot, before announcing, you'll be pleased to know that I have, that I have boil washed your underpants. With that, the Octobot flung a gigantic pair of unwashed men's underpants at the prince. They must have belonged to some humongous old man. Whoosh! They landed slap bang in the boy's face. Thank you, Octobot, whispered Alfred, as he removed the still stinky underpants from his nose. Now, are you ready for your game of croquet? No, hissed the boy. The robot swung its croquet mallet arm so hard it bashed the wall. Bang! So hard the arm itself came loose. Twunk! It fell on the floor with a crash, with seven arms rather than eight. It was now not so much an octobut as a, a, a septima butt. Outside the ballroom, Alfred could hear the, the bootsteps of royal guards growing nearer. Stomp, stomp, stomp. The soldiers were just outside the tall wooden double doors that led into the ballroom. You go that way, urged the boy, spinning the octobut round to face the, in their direction. The Pope needs his toenail clipping. Very good, Princess, came the reply. With all his might, Alfred pushed the octobut so it trundled off in the direction of the doors. As the boy tiptoed out of the ballroom, he looked back to see the octobut crash straight into the guards, knocking him to the floor and accidentally slapping one in the face with its corgi stroking hand. Slap, slap, slap. The guard grabbed the arm to make the robot stop and it came off in his hand. Oh no, exclaimed the robot. I will never strike a corgi again. The poor octopus was now down to six arms. It should really be named a sexabut, but that sounds far too rude. Ahead of, the Al ahead of Alfred was the entrance to the throne room. This was a fortress within the fortress of Buckingham Palace. In a way, it was a panic room, like a giant safe. It had been installed in case of an attack, or, horror upon horror, in case of revolutionaries, ever managed to break into the palace itself. The walls of the throne room had been made of metre-thick steel. The only way in or out was through a huge metal door, which opened only with fingerprint recognition. Just two people had access to that room. The first was the boy's father, the king. The second was the king's chief advisor, the Lord Protector. The Lord Protector was an elegant figure in his sixties. He was well-spoken and refined, with impeccable manners. A learned man, he spoke with great authority 
on any subject you might care to mention. Art, literature, philosophy. He wore a black shirt buttoned up to the top without a tie. And a smart grey suit. On his lapel he sported a gold pin badge, which, like the flag and armbands the Royal Guards wore, depicted with a griffin. The Lord Protector had worked at Buckingham Palace for as long as anyone could remember. He started off in the palace library, tending to the thousands of ancient books collected there. Most of the books were displayed on the shelves, but there was a handful kept under lock and key in a cabinet. Only the Lord Protector had the key. Like museum pieces, Alfred was not allowed to take these books up to his room. However, he could look at their covers. One intrigued him the most. It was an ancient red leather bound book with gold lettering on the front. The boy knew very little Latin, but he knew enough to translate that libro was a word you often found in library books. It meant book. So this was the Book of Albion. Once he'd slipped into the library unnoticed, Alfred had seen the Lord Protector studying it. Glancing over the man's shoulder, he saw there were ornate hand-painted pictures inside. Before he could make out what they were, the Lord Protector had slammed the book shut and locked it back in the case. Of course, this only intrigued the boy more. Over the years, the Lord Protector had gained the trust of the King to the extent that he had become his closest advisor. As the country slid into ruin with crops failing and no clean water to drink, the Lord Protector introduced extreme measures in the King's name. Food and water were rationed. There were curfews at night so people couldn't go outside. Punishments were severe, including execution. The government was outlawed. The army and police force were disbanded and replaced by the Royal Guard. The Union Jack was replaced by the flag of the Griffin. Since the catastrophic events that had plunged the kingdom into darkness, the king had relied heavily on the Lord Protector to guide him through this terrifying new world. Over the years, the king became more and more withdrawn, as if he'd not as if he disappeared into the back of his mind. No one knew why, exactly, but the king, who had once been so full of life, seemed as if he were one of the walking dead. Soon he was a ruler only in name. The country was controlled by the Lord Protector. When Alfred spied his mother being held, when Alfred spied his mother being held by the royal guards outside the huge metal door to the throne room, he seized his chance. The lady was making a lot of noise and struggling to get away. We've distracted the two soldiers. This is no way to treat your queen. Unhand me. Do you hear? Unhand me at once. The boy tiptoed behind them. And where? And when the metal door slid open, whoosh, he took a deep breath and sneaked in.